Okay. Good morning. Thank you to our second Chemistry Week talk. And today I'm joined by Graham Smith from AstraZeneca. And Graham is going to speak to you about a chemist's tale, a quick chemistry career and life overview with molecules and the story. So I'm going to hand over to you now, Graham. And if anyone has any questions, feel free to pop them into chat during the talk, or you can wait until the end and we will ask Graham the questions. Thank you and uh, welcome everybody. Good morning. <clears throat> My name is Graham Smith and I am a senior director of chemical toxicology at AstraZeneca, um, currently based around Cambridge. Uh, so this is a, a quick, uh, you know, I'm a chemist and I'm very proud and happy to be a chemist and I'm a, um, very keen to um, share the the fun and the joy that I've had in my career using my science to do what I hope you'll um, understand is some kind of cool and interesting things. Uh, I like traveling, so it's a bit of a travel story as well. Um, and I've only got five or six slides, but I talk a lot to each slide. So um, again, put questions in the chat and I'll leave time at the end, but uh, I'll just get on and tell you about my. Um, chemist's tale. Um, how do we do that? There. So uh, I'm... Uh, Graham, you're what? not sharing your screen. I'm not seeing the slides. Uh, interesting. <laughs> Sorry about that. It was working earlier. Let me... Right. Where's shift yeah, screen? Right, okay. I want to share PowerPoint. Let me, I think, is that working now? Got them. Sorry, I didn't hear. There's a. Yes, yes, got yes. them. Thank you. Okay. Um, did you see the first slide? That was. Uh, it's my. You see that slide? Uh, just in case, that was just my introduction slide, and now I'm on the second slide. Sorry about that. Uh, I am a medicinal chemist by training. That's uh, if you uh, ask what to put on my driver's license, I say I'm a medicinal chemist. And what does that mean? It means I work on all of the chemistry to do with medicines. Um, that can be um, what the tablet's made of, what the active drug is made of impurities, how to make the molecules. So everything chemistry that is related to drugs. And um, I like that job because it um, allows me to work on medicines and um, making new medicines uh, is really interesting. And there's always some very complicated challenges. There's always lots of sick people. Um, and I hope all of you are very well. And maybe some of you actually use some of our medicines. Um, if you have asthma or some other condition, you've probably um, taken a medicine and I'll talk to you about um, what a medicinal chemist's job is to, to create those medicines. Um, so uh, this wasn't how I started or why I started, but uh, I also, like I said, I, I enjoy travel. So um, in my career, um, I've, I've managed to travel to all of these places. And this is the only place I store it, but I have this map of the world. And every time I open this slide deck for to give it this presentation another time, I put another couple of X's on it, on places I've been. And as you can see, I, I didn't plan to become a chemist to see the world, but I, I've been quite a lot all over the world and, and quite a lot uh, of my travel has, has been due to uh, work-related things. Um, you're going to hear today about how I started my career in um, London over in Dagenham in Essex. Um, and that was, I spent a few years there before moving to Kent in Sandwich to work for a company called Pfizer, uh, uh, one of the largest pharmaceutical companies. I then went from there to Boston in Massachusetts. And down here, at the bottom is the building I used to work in in Boston, Massachusetts. Actually, it's right next to or very close to Fenway Park. You're probably more familiar with that building, but that's just, just in the neighborhood. And about five years ago, I came back and I'm working for AstraZeneca in Cambridge now uh, in this building. Um, 
near the Addenbrooke's Hospital. Um, so um, what is a medicinal chemist? Uh, and I'm going to tell you a little bit more about all of the things a medicinal chemist needs to learn after you've finished your education. Um, so this is what we do. Um, we are, um, the, the core of what we do is we design the molecules and make the molecules that become medicines. Uh, these, these medicines don't exist anywhere in the world beforehand. And the only thing that exists is we think this disease is caused by this bit of biology, which is broken. And maybe if we could find the right key to this lock uh, in a biological sense, we could unlock that and, and make things better. So that, that is the, how the conversations start. And then we're looking for, so what kinds of molecules might fit into that pocket? What kind of um, lock and key combination from a chemistry point of view might that work? And we can't control the biology because we're all human and our biology is human. So uh, what chemists can do is control the chemistry. So we change tiny aspects of the molecule. It's usually all organic chemistry, lots of organic chemistry. And we change all aspects of the molecule, the properties, the shape, um, the, the, the amount of rotation, the solubility, uh, all of those properties of a molecule need to be finessed into something that ultimately can be a, a safe and stable and useful medicine. Um, the whole concept of the lock and key is that is there's only one right shape for the, for the biology, for the therapeutic um, mechanism that you're dealing with. And, and a very simple thing is the baby toy where the, you put the shapes into the container. So if, if you try to put the square into the round hole, it doesn't work. So that medicine would not work for the disease that is to do with the round hole. You need a round shaped object of the right size to snugly fit into the round hole. And it's the same with chemistry. You need the right shape of molecule to fit into a, uh, a a, a, a protein that is dysfunctional in a disease of humans. And additional to the shape, there are these other molecular properties like, um, does it have aromatic rings? And does it have polarity like hydrogen bonds? Uh, I don't know if you've done that in, in chemistry yet, or is it, is it hydrophilic or does it have a dipole? I think dipoles is something you do in chemistry quite early in physics. So the, 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 the charge aspects as well as the shape all go to improve the medicines. Uh, it, and of course the medicines ultimately have to, you have to think about what the ultimate market for your medicine is. Ultimately we want to be able to sell a medicine that fits inside a tablet that can be easily taken maybe once a day by mouth, because that's what people are used to using. So the, some of those extra other bits get, you know, mean the properties of the molecule need to do other things as well. And as well as all of the, um, the things we want the medicine to do, we have to limit the number of things that we don't want those molecules to do because there are about 25,000 proteins in the human body from the, the human genome product project has identified that there are about 25,000 genes for proteins. We're talking about targeting one protein out of those 25,000, but our molecule has to then be exquisitively, exquisitively selective to only hit that one protein and not hit the other ones. Um, so that, there's a lot of iterative design and synthesis and testing and then design and synthesis and testing to improve and improve and improve the molecules. So this designer and maker part of the medicinal chemistry role is, is fundamental to what, this, uh, what, what, we, what we achieve. And when we've achieved something, we'll talk about that, some of those things in a, in a few times. It, it's, it's very rewarding to know that a disease that we were maybe not able to treat effectively before, this molecule that we've been involved in inventing, in conceiving, in designing, and then in patenting so that we can, you know, we've got an invention, um, uh, 
they, they can be used and then then they do get used and, and you get you know great feedback from patients saying thank you very much for the work that you did on this because now my mother is able to you know hold her grandchild or something like that you know that really we do, we don't interact with patients that they you know it, as a chemist we don't but when we see feedback like that about the ultimate um delivery of our drugs our molecules to patients it's it's really quite amazing um but but uh this this just shows you some of the the fundamental basic chemical synthesis work that has to happen in order that years down the line that research molecule uh, gets to market um so uh, we talked a little bit about that in the last slide but um there is a the, the the design is not just that um does the lock fit the key for the target we want there is a lot of other things to consider like we don't want the tablet to be um, the size of, um, I don't know, a, a Rubik's cube, let's say, um, because uh, that would be very hard to take. So the, the, the molecule has to be effective enough to be a small dose and a small tablet. Uh, um, we need the molecule to, to usually like to last a day because people are very used to using tracks of day. If you had to take a tablet every two hours, it would be very inconvenient. Um, they needs to be safe and not hit anything else we want it usually we pr pr prefer oral tablets to injections to inhalations to other ways that we could deliver medicines um so the the properties of the molecule have to take into all of those things like i say it's an iterative thing and some interesting maths here in that um I, I only took this from um, a, a, another person's slide, but the, there are something like 10 to the 18, and that's a big number in mathematical terms, um, permutations of the Rubik's cube um, uh, in that small molecule organic chemistry world. It's been calculated that there are something like 10 to the 62, that's 10 with 62 zeros after it possible isomeric combinations that could be medicines. And we have made nowhere near that number of molecules in the world's history. Um, there are maybe a few solutions to the problem of, does this molecule uh, hit the target? Does it, is it absorbed? Is it soluble? Is it safe? Um, uh, and we have to find and find those uh, unknown solutions from the, all the possibilities of molecules we could make. Incidentally, 10 to the 62 is a lot more than the number of atoms in the universe. So there is not enough atoms in the universe to even make all the possibilities of molecules that you could do. So there's some really big numbers for you. It is a very, very big space. And the right answer is a very, very small thing when you're talking about um, numbers of the order of 10 to the 62, um, which is, again, all the more reason why successfully finding the right molecule is uh, very rewarding and something to be very proud of. Um, so I'm a medicinal chemist. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about my timeline uh, and, uh, and then I'll um, just give you a little bit of um, uh sage advice to finish the talk in the next slide so uh i am you might not guess but i am nearly a geordie i was uh born in the northeast of england and i um i hope that you're all sitting there in a classroom with an inspirational chemistry teacher because i um ended up being inspired by chemistry by a couple of teachers that i can still remember vividly now. Uh, I, I had other inspirational teachers, but I was lucky that uh, I was very interested in chemistry and both of those guys connected with me. I um, went on to do a degree in chemistry after doing A-level maths, physics, chemistry. Um, and I did a, a, a degree in chemistry at Nottingham University. I like that university. It's kind of like in the middle of a park. 
So it was, you could always go out and walk around the park and they, all of, everything was within the campus of Nottingham University. So I spent six years there because after I'd done my degree, to be honest, I wasn't quite sure what I wanted to do for a career, but I knew I wanted to stay doing chemistry. And then I started to think about how to impact, how my chemistry would impact, um, how I could impact in my life with the skills that I had as chemist. And I started to think about, could I use it in medicine? And then I thought, and then I realized that pharmaceutical companies were the companies that hired chemists to help them work on medicines. So I started to think about that as a career only at the point when I was um, looking for a PhD. So I have a PhD, I'm a doctor, I'm very proud of that. Um, not many people are doctors and um, that opens some doors for you, I, I'll admit, but it's not for everybody. It's a lot of work and it's really hard work at the, at the, at the end there. Um, when I was doing my PhD, I worked on some molecules like this. So we start work, you know, I, to train as an organic chemist, you have to test yourself as that designer and maker. So you have to be able to design and make. That's what you need to learn to do. Uh, you need to remember the reactions that make the bonds that make the patterns that we're talking about here in some of these structures. So I worked uh, pretty unsuccessfully actually in my PhD on this molecule, which um, was found in a natural product and thought to be interesting. Uh, I don't think yet anybody's made that molecule, I'm not sure, but it's a really particularly complicated structure. Um, then uh, I did some more research over at Ohio State University with a very famous uh, professor called Leo Paquette. And I worked on this molecule, um, spinosin A. And as I left that after two years over in Ohio, I had made those, that five membered, you can see in the middle, there's a little structure there with a five membered ring, a six membered ring and a five membered ring. I'd made that bit and then a couple of people after me did the other bits and we ended up making, as a group, we ended up making this molecule. And this is a treatment for, it's a crop treatment for something like um, some kind of insect, uh, insecticide, that's right. And it makes about $300 million a year for, I think, Bayer, but it doesn't make me any money. Um, I left Ohio and went to what is now Sanofi, where, among other things, I worked on asthma medications. And um, although this treatment did not make it to the market for asthma, some people with a disease called chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, which is a kind of like a, a, a shortness of breath and a wheezing and a coughing, uh, sometimes people who've smoked a lot in their lives get that. Now, this treatment uh, is effective for those people. So those people now, there was no treatment for the, that disease at all um, when we were working on this. And uh, this molecule makes about $300 million a year. I then went to Pfizer. We saw, saw that on the map, I went down to Kent, and I worked on lots of projects while I was at Pfizer, uh, resulting in molecules like uh, sildenafil that had just gone on the market with Pfizer when I got there. So I was actually in the team just after they'd had that success. And I worked on the team for Maraviroc, but you know, sildenafil makes about a billion dollars a year and Maraviroc makes another few hundred. Um, uh, that was a great time. And lots of Pfizer makes lots of really good medicines. And that was a, a really uh, exciting time of my life. Uh, I went to Merck and I worked on some rather fundamental science around whether RNA rather than proteins could be therapeutically targeted. Uh, it's a bit complicated. I had a paper in Nature earlier this year, which is a very prestigious journal. So it's very uh, interesting science, but rather fundamental and maybe a bit beyond where we're at uh, today in the STEM world. But uh, really needed to understand all about therapeutically targeting and making molecules to be able to do that. Uh, and now I'm back at uh, AstraZeneca. I'm working in the area of toxicology. So I like to, I have the job of overseeing all the medicines at AstraZeneca to make sure that 
from a chemistry point of view, we are sure that they're more likely to be safe. So I kind of have oversight of other things. And we make molecules like osimertinib here, Tigrisor, which makes about $4 billion a year curing people of breast cancer, um, which is uh, another, maybe not curing, but extending the life of people with late stage, stage breast cancer for several years. It's a, a real breakthrough therapy there. Um, so I have been lucky to work in some great companies, and I have been luckier to be close to and involved with discovery of drugs that have real effect on, on uh, people's lives and, and get used by a lot of patients. Um, some final thoughts. Um, I've, I think I've made this point a lot. Um, medicines, um, although um, I think we'd rather we weren't taking them when we need them or when we're sick, um, they can be incredibly effective uh, and it has been uh, a real privilege, I think, for some of the, to work on some of the medicines that I've worked on and some of the teams that have worked really hard to make some of these medicines. Uh, I'm proud to have been part of those. Um, it does take a long time and it's very expensive and it's really hard to get that across in a talk like this, but the process takes 10 years from those design cycles at the beginning and billions of dollars, then that's a lot of money, more than I can even comprehend. So it takes thousands of people in these companies and thousands of patients in the end to prove that these medicines are safe and effective. Um, uh, one thing I'd leave you with, whatever you work in, uh, almost certainly you'll need teamwork. And I believe uh, teamwork is fundamental to a lot of jobs. So when you're young and learning, um, maybe you don't think about this, but to be effective longer time in your career, whatever you end up doing, and uh, I hope you have a lovely effective career in whatever you end up doing, but you will need to be a team player and work well with others. And those people are the people who uh, achieve more in their life. Um, there are still lots to do in terms of medicine, and I throw some things in here, all kinds of fancy new science. And um, as you see, I've, uh, I've come back to the UK. I like it here. My parents are still here, but I had a journey. I went out to America a couple of times, spent some time there. My kids grew up in America. Um, yeah, I got married and I came back. Uh, and um, uh, and one other thing that, as well as teamwork, I would say is never stop learning. I'm always still, I'm a, I'm a geek, I'll admit it. Uh, and I like every time I learn something really cool and new, I think that's a great day. So I'm always looking to learn how things work, how, you know, why that happens. Uh, and I'm learning all the time and I'm still learning. I don't know everything. Nobody knows everything. So keep learning and, uh, be a good team player and everything's going to be effective. Uh, so that is the end of my talk. I'm very happy for questions. I hope I timed that about right. Um, and um, please ask away because I have no idea what you'd be interested in, in hearing about. That's just me rambling. Thank you, Graham. That was really interesting. Um, does anybody have any questions for Graham? You just want to pop them in the chat or you, your teacher could come off of mute and call them out. That's perfectly fine. If you don't have any questions, you are free to leave the call, of course. <laughs> I've just put a link in the chat, which is to a feedback form as well. So if you think of any questions afterwards, you can add them onto the form. Oh, we have had one. How long did it take you to get to where you are now? <laughs> is that like a blinded, uh, slightly <laughs> obscured, how old am I? Uh, we could go back there. So um, it has taken me to where I am. I've been, okay. So I am 56. Um, I studied at university until I was 26-ish, something like that, I think, 25, 26. 
And I've been, I think, <laughs> a fairly senior and efficient medicinal chemist for about 15, 20 years. So I've been in the industry for 30 years. That's a lot. But I hate to tell you, but you're all going to have to work for 30 to 40 years. Uh, you haven't started even yet, but there's a lot of years of work ahead of you. Uh, I've done 30 of them and I'm not near the end yet. So uh, I might be nearer the end than the beginning, but uh, I'm not planning to stop just yet. Um, so, yes, 30 years in the industry, 56, 25 ish years of education. I, those are some numbers around where it is, but I've been effective in my job um, for, I would say, I was. A, it took me 10 years just to be really good at my job, I think, after starting. Do you see what I mean? You know, you start a job and you're not perfect at it. You're, tr you're hired a, to learn. There are a couple of other questions in yeah, chat as well. Right. So are there lots of opportunities to travel is the first one. And the second question is, did you have any part in the development of the COVID vaccine? Um, very small. So the second question, very small part uh, in considering some of the safety aspects as we were doing that in COVID. From this very room, people were pinging me about like, do we need to do this? Can we assume that? Da, 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 because we were going very fast and the regulators wanted us to go very, very fast. Uh, in that, so a very small part in that, but um, people just south of Cambridge at Granter Park, in the other part of in the, in the vaccines part of um, AstraZeneca, were very involved, and some of my other safety colleagues were very involved all the time. Um, so, but that wasn't me. I, I don't. I I was not close to that. Um, the other question now is just uh, what was the other the, the first this COVID vaccine question, and then the Yes, yeah, so were there are there lots of opportunities to travel? Used to travel. Mm. Um, there had been, um, and a lot of because we're scientists, there's a lot of um, scientific discussion that happens both in journal publishing, so writing scientific research articles and discussing them, and then conferences where people go and discuss and present those that science that new science so there is the opportunity to do that as well as when you're in a global company traveling between sites to get face-to-face -face time with colleagues for more complicated discussions that's also true um, i fly to sweden a few times a year from from cambridge um, less and less so is the complicated thing because actually sustainability is a big driver for big companies these days and um, sustainability and air travel are not very compatible so we're having a lot of discussions now in big industries about how sustainable is all of the travel around the world so um, i think there will be less than there was uh, there were times when at pfizer when i literally went every second week to Massachusetts, to Connecticut, actually, uh, and worked the week, worked three days a week in Connecticut, uh, about 20 times a year. <laughs> and that's that type of travel is not sustainable, even physically for a human being. It's not very easy, I can tell you. <laughs> so, so, um, uh, but I yeah. doubt very many people are doing that because there was not such thing as video conferencing and video conferencing takes all of this away. The um, final question is, what did you get in your GCSEs? Did, did you do well at school? I went to quite a poor comprehensive school in the northeast of England. I shall not name too many names. And I got no GCSEs, I can tell you, because there weren't any, because <laughs> there were O levels in my day, but the, the equivalent. And did I get seven? I got seven and I might have got two Bs and the rest of them Cs. I got very bad GCSEs. Uh, I then went to a very good sixth form college uh, and I got A in chemistry, A in physics, B in maths for my A levels. So, um, uh, 
that school set me up for success because I'm not sure I, I was going to be successful um, with my GCSEs, but I always passed my sciences and maths, obviously, and English, because uh, you need English for everything. Um, but um, yeah, I went with what I was good at and what I liked. I really liked physics, actually. I had a very inspirational physics teacher as well, um, and I nearly did physics uh, at university, but that's history. <laughs> Life may have taken a very different path if you'd have yeah. chosen a different subject. Different story. Who knows what it would have been. Exactly. Uh, Thank you ever so much, Graham. It's been very, very inspirational and very informative as well. I'm going to stop the recording now.